everybody. My name is Alicia Orozco, and I am here today with our experts. Uh, and thank you for joining us to the webinar, What's at Stake for Small and Rural Transit Providers. Just a little bit about Transportation for America. We are an alliance of elected business and civic leaders from across the country that wants smart, locally driven transportation solutions. Just before we go ahead and get started with the actual presenters, I wanted to go ahead and go over a little bit of logistics. Today we are recording the webinar and we will be um, sending it out to everyone that has registered and it will be via PowerPoint and also recording. And today we are only taking questions via chat box and that is uh, the box you see on your screen on the left uh, bottom side of your screen. Today, Experts are Kevin Thompson, and he's our Director at Transportation for America, Nancy Hohen, and she is the Transportation Manager at Arctex Council of Governments. We also have the Honorable Edwin Pickle, and he's a former City Councilman for the City of Paris, Texas. And we also have Mike Nunn, and he is the Director of Transportation at the City of Burlington, North Carolina. And last, we have Rich Samson, and he is from the Community Transportation Association of America. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Kevin. Kevin? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you still on the um, – well, I guess we're just getting to noon time on the West Coast, so good, good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you all for taking time out to, to be with us today. Um, before I get into my uh, slides, I just want to also acknowledge some other colleagues who are here in the room with me and certainly available to help answer your questions at the end of our presentation. First, um, Scott Goldstein, who is our Director of Policy here at T4A, um, Erica Young, who is our Vice President of Strate Strategic Partnerships at Smart Growth America, Alex Beckman, who is a Policy Associate here at um, uh, Transportation for America, and Dan Levine, who uh, is on our policy team here at T4A as well. So uh, thank, thank you to all of you uh, for coming. Um, uh, as Alicia mentioned earlier, we sent out a little while ago uh, a memo that laid out some specific threats that were facing um, rural, rural areas, particularly in the face of current budgetary proposals, uh, both in Congress and, and uh, put forth by the administration. So we hope to be able to address uh, these four key points for you today. And if we, if we don't do that to your satisfaction, please chime in and and ask a question of us. Uh, we definitely want to hit on um, all of the highlights related to what the President has proposed and what the, the current st uh, state of play is for appropriations uh, in the Congress. Um, we also want to uh, draw a little light to better understand what uh, any cuts or reductions, eliminations, or phase-outs of any of our transit programs mean for um, um, uh, rural and small town providers, uh, and we want to provide some sort of outlook um, as well. So with that, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this slide um, is really um, uh, uh, an attempt to sort of illustrate the impact of general fund transfers within the context of underlying uh, imbalances between the highway trust fund revenues and the projected spending between 2016, FY 2016, and FY 2026. So that uh, takes us through FAST Act and beyond FAST Act. Um, as many of you probably already know, the, the single greatest challenge to sustaining uh, federal funding uh, for public transportation rests in how Congress ultimately is going to handle its funding challenges with the Highway Trust Fund. This is the, the primary place where we, we derive money for this program. Um, so this, this slide is really looking at that. It, it, it's really pointing out that um, we have a repeated pattern that we've been trapped in um, at the federal government for about 12 years in keeping the, the Highway Transit Fund solvent. In other words, we have been borrowing Peter to pay Paul. We've been taking money out of the general fund to keep the highway transit fund uh, afloat. And as, as most of you probably also know, the highway transit fund, and specifically the mass transit account, um, funds a significant portion of the uh, public transit programs. 
So these are essential revenue for many of uh, the transit properties around the country. Um, for many years, the uh, federal service transportation programs were funded almost entirely from taxes on motor fuel deposited into the highway trust fund. Um, although there have been some modifications to uh, that tax system over time, to the tax rates, uh, which are fixed in terms of the cents per gallon that are assessed, um, they have not been increased at the federal level since 1993. Um, so I think that bears mentioning. The first time we actually excised the tax uh, like this in the United States was during the, uh, during the, uh, the Depression in 1932, um, and it was really a budget saving uh, measure, um, and it was a one cent tax. Um, and it has only been increased three or four times since that period, with 1993 being the most recent time. Um, <clears throat> prior to the recession that we uh, had just come out of uh, that began in 2007, uh, the annual increases in, in driving along with the, uh, uh, the increases in fuel use um, were sufficient in most years to keep um, the revenue rising steadily. Uh, but that just simply is no longer the case. Uh, so we find ourselves back where we have been before. Um, although the vehicle miles traveled um, uh, have recently surpassed um, pre-recession levels, the future increase in um, fuel economy standards are, that are expected to reduce motor fuel consumption and therefore fuel tax revenue in years ahead. Um, Congress has yet to um, address uh, the service transportation program's most fundamental revenue issues and has given it given uh, limited legislative consideration to raising fuel taxes in recent years. Instead, in 2008, um, Congress has uh, financed the Federal Service Transportation Program by supplementing the fuel tax with transfers from the U.S. Treasury General Fund. Um, in, in total, we have more, much more than $100, mil, uh, $100 billion that have moved from the General Fund into um, the Highway Trust Fund over the last dozen or so years. Um, most, most recently, that transfer was $70 billion after um, the enactment of the FAST Act, which is our most recent reauthorization, and that program expires on September 30th, 2020. Um, so we have about, as you can see here, and, uh, you know, uh, an outlook that looks like we will be running deficits um, even earlier than, than, than uh, the September 30th, 2020 deadline, unless Congress uh, decides to act. Um, so that is, is the dilemma for this program. Um, we're not going to get into, you know, how all the revenue fixes that, that people have talked about related to um, fixing, if you will, the, the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, we can certainly uh, do another webinar on that at some time because that's a whole conversation <laughs> unto itself. Uh, but it, it just bears mentioning that that's where we are. And just to, to crystallize it or put it a little more in perspective, um, if you just thought about, you know, how Congress does reauthorizations, they either do them in five- or six-year tranches. Um, if we chose to do a, a five-year reauthorization, um, in 2020, uh, beginning in, in FY21, um, we would be looking at all things being equal and staying the same today uh, with no increases in any revenue. Uh, we'd be looking at about $103 billion shortfall for the next five-year authorization. So that's about 20, it's averaging about $20 billion a year. If it were a six-year reauthorization, that shortfall could be as large as $127 billion or about $21.2 billion uh, per, per year. So this is a, a, a particularly sticky and difficult issue. Um, so I, I, we wanted to share that just as context. Now, if we go on to the next slide, Alicia, thank you. Uh, this slide is a table that um, we are sharing that just basically summarizes the state of play right now with uh, trans public transportation dollars. Uh, you see the column uh, labeled FY17 enacted. Uh, all of these dollars are in millions. Um, the president's proposed budget um, 
it, it bears mentioning that the President's budget and the House uh, Appropriations sub sub Subcommittee um, markups both um, look at either reducing, significantly reducing, or phasing out or eliminating uh, some of the programs that pro uh, uh, public tr uh, transit properties have really grown to rely upon, most notably that Small Starts program. Um, that is uh, zeroed out in the President's budget. Uh, they're not funding anything that will be a new program. They will be allowing programs that are in the pipeline with a group signed agreements to continue to go forward, but they will be, they're proposing to, to eliminate that. Uh, the House uh, is, is, of course, has cut the program significantly and only is looking at $182 million uh, set aside for that program. Um, the Senate bill, of course, is looking at $318 billion uh, for, for the program. So there's some wide differences between um, the, the different versions of the two uh, chambers' uh, bills uh, that will have to be worked out, um, and that will all have to be worked out in the context of whatever um, our, our budget caps end up being. And Scott can probably uh, – uh, best answer some of those questions, but that will be another wrinkle to all of this. Another place that I just want to point out are the Tiger Funds, um, which are entirely zeroed out. Um, this has been a, a competitive program that many, many transit properties around the country who have not been able to find other ways to access federal dollars have used this program, and it's very, um, it is a very competitive program, but they are very uh, – the demand is much higher than what, uh, the, what the federal DOT could ever provide. Um, it typically has gotten about $500 uh, million per year. Um, here uh, you're looking at uh, zeroing out in the president's budget. It's zeroed out in the House uh, plan, um, and it is just a little above what its um, standard um, appropriation of $500 million is. In the, Senate, in the Senate version. On the lower end of the, um, of the uh, chart are intercity passenger rail um, uh, uh, marks for the budget. Uh, so I thought I would share those with you. A, the Amtrak is a big issue in many rural areas and frequently one of the one ways that, uh, one of the few ways that you can look beyond an automobile to connect with other communities. Uh, around. So a large part of that is the national network, um, and I think it's worth noting here that the President's budget is more than half of what uh, Amtrak normally receives for, um, for its um, appropriation for the national network. So it's a big cut uh, to their program. Uh, both the House and the Senate recognize the importance of this program and are funding it um, in their versions of the bill. Um, at roughly the same rate um, that it was enacted in 2017. Um, the other program is the Federal State uh, Partnership for State of Good Repair uh, and the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Grants are other mechanisms that states have been able to utilize to shore up uh, intercity passenger rail um, uh, um, in their areas. And um, while those have, you know, been, been very well subscribed to, 25 million, 68 million in the FY17 budget, uh, the numbers are um, somewhat lower um, in the president's budget, particularly for consolidated rail, and um, significantly different for the House and the Senate versions. The House certainly has a, a, a very big boost up for the program. Um, and the Senate, certainly um, a, a, a large boost for the Consolidated Rail Program. Um, so this just gives you a bird's eye view of what is happening. We're happy to get into the nitty gritty on some of these and talk to you about those, but I just wanted to present um, what, the, what the picture of the, the landscape looks like at this point. Thank you, Kevin. And just a reminder to everybody, if we are taking questions uh, via chat box. And now we're gonna go ahead and pass it over to Nance. Nancy. Thank you, Alicia. I wanted to let you know first, though, that um, Congre or, uh, Councilman Pickle got dropped off the call, 
So he is called back in, but he's not patched into the webinar. So I don't know if you're able to resolve that or not. Uh, yes, well, I, I will try to do that. But you can go ahead and start your presentation, and we'll go yep. from there. Yep. Thank you very much. So um, I appreciate everybody's time today, and I, hopefully I'll be bringing you a little bit of a good news story. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, Arctex Council of Governments is responsible for nine counties in Northeast Texas, rural public trans transit district that was formed by TxDOT. So um, you can go to the next slide if you would. Every five years, um, all of the transit districts in the state of Texas are required to put together a coordinated uh, transportation plan. So the project that we're talking about today grew out of that. Um, it was recommended when we met with all the stakeholders in the city of Paris, Texas, that um, a fixed route bus service was something that they really wanted. And so this, um, you know, nothing happens uh, overnight. So this really was about a, a three-year project going from planning to uh, launch of the service. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that I can not emphasize enough, and this is why I had asked uh, Councilman Pickle to be on the phone, I think having the support of your local municipality, um, whether it's um, you know, financial or whether it's just policy-wise, but we were able to um, initially approach the city um, and ask for the, their assistance with in-kind services, which I think most people know we can use that as match to pull down um, 5311 and 5310 funding through uh, the state. And uh, they agreed to put up all the bus stop signs. They have agreed to do all of the uh, user engineering department, to do the utility conflicts. Um, that kind of thing. So that was very, very meaningful on the front end of this was to have them um, you know, there as a partner from the beginning. So can we go to the next slide? And I think that this is one of those things that um, you know, for a community of roughly 25,000 that has not had um, bus service since I believe the 1940s, this was something that took a lot of um, persuading, and I think that uh, Councilman Pickle's back on the phone, so I'm going to let him uh, take it over at this point and just kind of tell you what his uh, perception was on this from the beginning. Okay, yes, I am back here now finally. Thank you. Uh, my interest originally got started with this from sidewalk issues because we discussed as a city that we were having problems with a lot of our people uh, getting around because our sidewalks were in such sa sad shape. Well, then we started realizing that it was it was a bigger problem than that because people couldn't get to uh, their medical needs, they couldn't get to the grocery stores, they couldn't get anywhere. So we had some uh, meetings with just individuals within the community that expressed their interest and their need for some sort of a transportation system. And to be honest, I wasn't really excited about it at the time because I didn't think it would be utilized very well. Um, once we started talking to everyone and getting everyone involved, it became apparent that, that there was a fantastic need for this, and it was something that uh, I think that, that through our United Way office, we were really able to, to get it going with April Carl's assistance. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that, that really set set me in motion was talking to the school districts. Um, and the, our K through 12 grades expressed some need for it, but, our, but PJC really, the, the president of, of the college was really excited about it because she believed that it would really help increase their enrollment, um, not just from accessibility from uh, students, but also from uh, handicapped students, people in wheelchairs and things of that nature. And, and that was the thing that, that really surprised me because I hadn't uh, even thought about that part of it. And mm -hmm. so um, we all got behind it and pushed and, and went to the other entities, and we have had, had no one turn us down yet. Yep, that's a very good point. 
So once we got into the nitty gritty of how do we get this done, I think that the realization set in that we had been running an eight hour a day demand response service where people call in, book their rides in advance, and we take them where they need to go and then return them home. And the consensus really was in the community that if we were going to launch a fixed route system that it really needed to be a 12 hour a day service, so we are operating it from 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., and that was done primarily for work-related purposes. People needed to be able to get to work, you know, the start at 8 o'clock if need be, classes at the junior college starting at 8 o'clock. So that was really the goal. And as um, Councilman Pickle said, we had to go out and approach different entities in the community, and to do that, we structured it um, more as a partnership or a sponsorship. And we um, secured $165,000 in sponsorships, and we asked people when we went to commit for multi-year because we didn't want to be launching something without knowing that we had the stability of you know, continuing um, over you know, the foreseeable future to, to be able to have this operating. So um, United Way, stepped up with the $25,000 a year commitment for three years, as did the city, as did the junior college. Um, the Paris Regional Medical Center stepped up and committed that amount of money. They also provided um, rent-free space in a former medical office building. And um, then we also approached a number of local fa family foundations within the community. And we, um, we were actually able to, to be successful in all of that. Could we have the next slide, please? And I think that what I would suggest to all of you that are, are needing to do something similar is try to create it as a win-win partnership. Um, we went to these people not just asking for a check. We went to them um, and said, look, we need your support, but we can promote your business or your organization on these vehicles that we are um, going to be running around the community. So you see some examples on here of Texas Oncology. They were another um, private entity that came forward and, and sponsored as well as the hospital. And then the uh, looking for a doctor piece is on the back of all of the route maps. So the hospital for their level of commitment had uh, dibs on that. And then the other thing that was really interesting is we listened to our partners. So when we were visiting with Paris Regional Medical Center, we said, you know, we'll do a semester pass. And they requested to be able to sell them at the college because then the students could put them on their Pell Grants. So we were able to do that. With Texas Oncology, they requested that we actually make a loop through their parking lot because there's a pretty substantial grade change from the street up to their building. And so we were able to work it with them that they installed a light right outside their door, similar to on a hotel when they're calling a taxi, where if there's a patient that needs to be picked up, they can turn that light on. That way the bus driver will know it as he's pulling through the lot. Um, and the person can wait inside in the air conditioning, which if you've spent a summer in Texas, you'll know how important that is. So those are, I guess, just a couple of ways that we customize things. If you could go to the next slide, please. And then we thought, and this goes back to what Edwin said, you know, people in town didn't know what a fixed route bus system was. If you hadn't lived in Dallas or somewhere else that had a, a fixed route service, People didn't even know how to use one. So we wanted to make it really obvious that there was something happening. So we branded it and we worked the colors and the, um, the logos to keep with the community. And um, we had to go round and round with TxDOT on the bus stop signs because they wanted us to use a very generic, uh, nondescript bus stop sign. And we were adamant that we needed people to, to know that there was something new happening in town. If you can go to the next slide, please. And so then this is kind of wrapping it up. And you know, was, was all this work worth it? And um, you know, as you can see from the pictures there, the one gentleman was our first monthly pass. So we have a big Campbell's soup manufacturing facility in Paris. 
and he had been walking miles each way every day to get to work, and he was now able to ride the bus. Um, the other picture is our first service animal that was on the bus, which was great. And um, the quote there is from uh, Dr. Anglin and, uh, of the junior college. I think the thing that's interesting, too, is we structured this um, to be the best benefit, and anybody 60 and over or disabled rides the bus for free. And um, the, the best, I guess, the proof is in the pudding. We were able to do about 10,000 trips a year before uh, we launched this service, and we uh, topped 47,000 trips this year. The first year it was in operation, and it's building every single month. We just are going to be getting new vehicles delivered within the next couple of weeks that are higher capacity. At this point, we have to send chaser buses out on the routes um, because the the buses that we currently are running really were old rural buses that we converted over. So I think the partnerships is really what got this done. You know, we're never going to have the funding unless you have, you know, the ability to create a tax. Um, we're never going to have the funding without those partnerships. So Edwin, could you want to talk just a, a minute about kind of the feedback in the community? Um, sure. I, the feedback has been just it's fantastic, and uh, to be honest, even uh, surprising to me. Uh, one of the things that, that I didn't talk about was when we first got this thing kicked, going, trying to get kicked off, we had sort of a, uh, be, me being a city councilman and uh, had a running battle with our local county judge who's also involved with ATCOG and, uh, because he didn't think that, that it would be very successful. Um, and, and even he is one of our, our staunchest proponents now uh, because he's seen the, the utilization of it uh, and the entire community, there's not been anything negative said about this whole program, um, and it's, it, it has even raised awareness of people in the community seeing the uh, bus stop signs because they are all over town, and people are aware of them. Uh, they're using them. That they want to be in, to be in support of it. Um, my, my only hang-up all along has been, that I would love it to be seven days a week. Um, and again, that only takes money. And so we're going to try to get what we can locally and see what we can do that, go in that direction. Mm -hmm. So it's been a real pleasure to bring this to the community. Um, I think that the tie-in between transportation and um, medical outcomes is gaining a lot more um, focus on a national level, and there was the uh, report that was out earlier this year called the Rides to Wellness Community Scan Project that um, was put out by the Health Outreach Partners, and that speaks directly to the financial impact on the hospitals and other medical providers when people miss appointments or they don't follow up post-discharge from the hospital and can't get to um, you know, the drugstore to fill a prescription, those kinds of things. So those tie-ins, I think, are really important. And I think that what we have heard um, from a lot of the social service agencies in Paris that work with this uh, target population, if you will, the lower income and, uh, you know, just transit-dependent people, the ability for people to get a job, because when they would go to interview in the past and they asked, you know, if they had reliable transportation, the answer was no. Well, now the answer can be yes. So, so I think just that in and of itself has been um, huge for the community at large. So, Thank you, Nancy and, I, and Edwin. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that's it. So I think at that point, unless Edwin's got anything else, then we'd like to turn it over to Mike for his presentation. Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll talk to you about our system that started actually last June, uh, June of 16. There's my slide there, uh, in Burlington. Burlington is located in North Carolina. We're, we're roughly between Raleigh, Durham, and Greensboro, Winston Salem. Uh, major interstate going through our, our county that gets you between the two, uh, basically metropolitan centers. So go ahead and change that slide. Uh, for many years, uh, a lot of the comments what you heard already. The foundation is very similar. 
Uh, but we we probably spent a little bit longer time, uh, very cautiously. Uh, you know, basically council members, uh, the community, uh, our agencies. We started our study in 2006. Um, it sort of marinated for six or seven years, uh, talking about public transportation. We had no public transportation option in our community except for the demand response where you could call and make the reservation, but nothing for fixed routes. So if you didn't have a vehicle in our community, uh, you either had a, a taxi or a good neighbor taking you places. So we talked about that for several years, uh, looked at all of our community partners as far as the other cities and towns went, uh, opened the system up to everyone. We had over 10 to 11 communities around us that had an interest, really when it came down to it, uh, the largest one being Burlington, and then actually the smallest one, uh, Gibsonville. You see there the third bullet, Gibsonville actually jumped on board first. Um, so you've sort of got two extremes now being partners uh, in that. Um, so they had a huge need in Gibsonville. They did not have a grocery store, no grocery store in the community at all. So uh, it was very important for them to be a part of this. So we went through the process, the urban process. Uh, we're part of an MPO. We're the actually a metropolitan planning organization, so we have access to the 5307 grant. Uh, had never used that grant before. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it's based on your population. You earn those funds, uh, basically you know, competition free. So we've been helping other communities build their transit uh, over the years by not using our funds. So that started to resonate in the community once our feasibility showed that you know, we had a good basis for public transportation and we started looking at the money and then they were realizing we're earning those funds, we need to find a way to use them. Uh, so that was a key point once that education piece came about about the, the dollars and the grants. And that may be something uh, that sometimes gets overlooked, you know, really educating uh, your, your officials and people about, okay, what is available to us? And if we're not using it, you know, how, how is that, you know, how are we not helping ourselves by doing that? So we jumped out uh, there quickly after 14, strong branding and public education. You heard earlier uh, about people not knowing what fixed route is. Uh, we went with a strong brand process as far as what would the name be. We were very careful about our name. Um, I mentioned everyone being invited to join. We still believe that's going to happen in the future. So we didn't use you know, Burlington or Gibsonville in the system. We used to use Link. Link was a way to connect our communities. Uh, but that was very important uh, at the startup, and that took us over a year. Uh, we did a lot of just uh, partnership building, like you heard, you know, either from United Way to county commissioners, uh, some private foundations, uh, employment agencies, uh, our hospitals, our universities, places, uh, community colleges, uh, all the places that public transportation could be a benefit. So we spent a lot of time with those partners up front, just answering the very easy questions and then you know, going back, back and getting more information about how we could directly benefit uh, their operation. So we jumped forward to June of 16. Uh, everything started off well. We had five routes, five days a week. Uh, so we are Monday through Friday and it's 5.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Go ahead and change that slide. Um, so we got started. Always, I showed this a little bit. We use this a lot as we were building momentum Burlington's right there in the middle. All the other communities you see on that slide have public transportation and have had it for several, several years. So we're over just over 50,000 in population. Um, we do that for two reasons, to, to show people sometimes we don't get out of our own community and realize what size we are, and then number two, to realize, you know, this is a, an urban area, a metro, you know, between two metro, and our, our citizens are starting to expect you know, an option, whether they use it once a week or every day. Um, as a community, a, a city government, we, we're sort of being looked at to say, you know, we need this as an option in our community. So that's just a snapshot of where we are compared to some other, you know, medium-sized cities in North Carolina. Next slide. This was a quick, I thought this was uh, important as well. We went out and did some analysis, uh, public meetings, uh, went to all the festivals and, and, and downtown, uh, you know, events and just asked, what does public transportation mean to you? And a lot of those buzz, buzzwords you see, um, you know, opportunity, uh, access, independence. We had a lot of folks in our community that had never been, you know, from one side of the community to the other. They hadn't been to the new uh, retail development because they didn't have transportation, nor could they get a job 
in that area because they didn't have transportation. So a lot of this stuff came out of the feasibility study. A lot of these key words came from our citizens that, uh, you know, reaffirmed that we're on the right, you know, we're on the right track here. This is the kind of things that they want to use public transportation for. Next, please. A lot of you, uh, if you have a system or if you're playing the system, these are probably very familiar to you. Uh, this is how we designed our service. Of course, residential and public service agencies, you know, a lot of those multifamily developments, uh, a lot of riders there, medical facilities, always going to be one of your key locations. Shopping, residents over 60, over 65, um, persons below the poverty level. We use the basic census information as well uh, to sort of map our community and, and see where the, the folks would didn't have access to transportation may be living. We have a, a fairly robust network of park and ride lots in our Piedmont region of North Carolina, meaning you can go east or west just by getting to these lots. Uh, and they were in our community, and this is the interesting part, they were in here in our community, but everyone was driving there, of course, their own vehicle. So it was limiting you know, that service somewhat. So all of our routes do go to our park and lot ride lots now, and that's a partnership with other transit agencies, which is something else you may want to keep in mind. Um, not just your funding partners do you want to be uh, communicating with, but also those transit systems that are already operating around you, because uh, that can help you as well as, as them as far as riders go. Uh, we did recognize that most of our stops are going to be on major thoroughfares. We don't go down into neighborhoods. Uh, and another new education piece was you're going to have to walk, you know, probably a couple blocks to a bus stop. Uh, and that was something we looked at as far as sidewalks, um, making sure we have those or we're in a major development program for those now because that's very important. Not only getting people to understand what fixed route transportation is, but how do they get there and, you know, removing those barriers to get them to the bus stops. So we're, uh, we were started that almost as soon as we approved the system to build it because you can have your routes and your buses and equipment, but if people can't get there safely, um, it's going to limit your ridership. Next, please. This is just the basics of that 5307 grant, the, the federal formula grant I mentioned before. Uh, it was a huge benefit and continues to be a huge benefit to us if, you know, or urban area if you're eligible for that. 80% you know, of our planning, administration, and capital costs come from that. 50% after we you know, draw back any local participation, 50% of our operating uh, is for that. That was uh, eye-opening. It's been that way uh, all along. Again, I mentioned that education process we did about the funding. It took several meetings with elected officials for them to understand uh, the financial you know, benefit of this. We have no other grant that we found that pays 80% of you know, basically the planning and admin, nor 50% of the operating uh, the city government, you know, year after year after year. Um, so that was a benefit once they figured that out. You see there we get about 1.5 million. Uh, that will go up with population unless the formula changes. Um, we do get a little bit of money from our state DRT, North Carolina Department of Transportation, but it's non-capital. Um, they, they sometimes offer 10%, up to 10% on that capital. Um, but that's really a small portion of the funds that we're, that we're spending. And then a key part of us, which may be for you, uh, that $1.5 million has quickly become competitive in a region. It's not just for our system, it's for other, other systems as well. So the game's changing a little bit on that as well. It used to be all towards the fixed route or the urban system. Well, now it's uh, now available to urban and rural and other providers, regional providers as well. So we're going through a process of, of adjusting to that. Next slide. Uh, we do have, as mentioned earlier, we do have, a, our state legislature provides a way that local communities can have a transit vehicle tax, and we did, our council did pass that uh, with the start of our system. It basically says, as you see there, um, it's, a, it's a transit tax. It's per vehicle registered inside of a city. Uh, ours is $5, uh, and that has to go towards public transportation. And it can't be, uh, it has to supplement, as you see there. You can't just use that as your only funds and there's no other city money involved. Uh, what the, the legislature said is, we will partner with you and give you this tool, but you have to also be, you know, have some, some skin in the game as well. So we're using this. It's generating about 200000 a year 
so far, and that's just, of course, based on the register of vehicles uh, in our city limits. Uh, that's a city council action is all that provided. Next. I mentioned our operating hours. Uh, as you know, I uh, heard earlier about extension. Uh, everyone would like it to run seven days a week already. You know, we're 16 months in, and that's the first thing we hear uh, is to go to Saturday and Sunday. You know, possibly also for employment to go from you know to 7:30 or 8:30 at night. Um, so that's going to be the first thing that that comes to mind. That's a funding issue. You know, that that just takes dollars. We had the same equipment. We can just keep running it, but that's a a funding commitment that we'll have to go back through. Our schedules, our system was designed uh, for hospital personnel in the beginning to make sure they got to that first shift, first shift work. Uh, they're one of the last ones in our community to have really a shift schedule. So we wanted to make sure that we hit, um, you know, of course they're working hours and they're off at about 4, 4.30. But um, most of the folks can get to work. We are hearing people that say, you know, in at 6.30 it may be difficult to get back home. Uh, so we're doing a lot of, of research and, and looking at, okay, how do we get, make sure we capture that employment trip because that's your day in, day out rider uh, as well as your medical appointments. One of our large challenges is uh, our service area. Uh, it's, it's an hour and a half. If you get on our bus from downtown, you're going to ride 45 minutes out to the end of the route and 45 minutes back in. So if you're at a bus stop, it's going to be about an hour and a half um, or just a little less before you can get back from where you went. So um, we're hearing feedback that that's a challenge. Um, the only way to do that is to add more equipment and more frequency. So quickly as you start a system, uh, as, it, as they're, you've, they're successful, you know, it's the next step. Okay, I want to use this, and I'm glad it's here, but now I need to see how I can fit my schedule, my, my appointments, and my work. And if it doesn't, you run the risk of sort of you may lose that rider. So we're, we're, we're very aware of, of, of the concerns that people have. Uh, it's just how fast can we get that service out there. Next slide. Here's our vehicle. Uh, it seats about 22 people. We looked at the 35-foot bus or the 30-foot bus. You know, you see in a transit in a city area, and that's the way we were going. You know, we thought we were going to you know go to the city bus route, and we did a lot of talking and a lot of looking at other styles that are out there. This is a low floor uh, vehicle. It's ADA accessible. Uh, the ramp comes out of the door if you need the ramp, but it's one step in. Uh, it, it, it's held up very well. Um, people like it. You see our bright colors, again, going back to our branding, um, making sure people knew what this bus was uh, and, and making sure they see the link name. On the back and on the sides, we have our website and phone numbers and things like that. Uh, but the community is taking this very well. Uh, the kids in the schools, uh, the elementary and middle schools, you know, they know what Link Transit is. We've really tried to connect with them as far as uh, even coordinating some of their field trips to get on at the bus stop and ride it to where they're going and come back. You know, any way we can involve the young folks, uh, you know, they take that information home and it sort of becomes a, an accepted community thing. To, you know, let's use the bus. Let's take the bus. Uh, so we're really working with that. Uh, the only thing that we saw with these were the buses were about five to seven years, so we'll have to go back out shortly uh, and, and look for additional equipment. Some of the stuff you see there I went through with the dollar to ride, uh, which we think is very economical. Um, we do have our paratransit service, which is growing tremendously. It's within three quarters of a mile of the routes, and you're a certified medical user. You can use our bus uh, from door to door. We'll pick a, take a van to pick you up. Uh, that grows quickly. I mentioned about the park and ride lots. Um, don't underestimate that. You know, our community you know, loves our service, and it's growing, but they also want to go other places. So we're looking both east and west to do that. So the, you know, the final highlights, uh, now the employers are contacting us before we had to reach out to them to explain what it was and, you know, would you use our system, do you want a bus stop. Uh, it sort of flipped the page, if you will, in the last 12 months. Uh, students now in our community at the community college, they can go to class and go to work. And what that means is they were having to go out to the community college, take a couple classes, and sit and wait for someone to come get them or take them back home, and most times they couldn't have a job because of that. Uh, so now they can do both things, uh, have a job and get their education at the same time. We're moving from a, uh, a phase of what fixed route is to what the benefits are of public transportation. We feel like we've sort of hit the education part about what we are, 
we want people to understand what they can benefit by using our system. Uh, so that'll be our next phase. 50, over 50% 50 of our trips are all the medical and the retail uh, and employment, which is what we were focused on. Uh, we've gone over 100,000 passengers in the first 12 months. Uh, the morning hours seem to be increasing, uh, employment times, things like that. The employers, you know, they're advertising their jobs now on the green route or on the purple route, or we have a bus stop at this, at this place. So the culture is changing a little bit to really use the system. Uh, the key thing at the bottom there is just mobility and access to the, to the jobs and all that before folks, you know, had to find their own ways to get places. And it's becoming more of a community connection now. People re really identify Burlington and Gibsonville, you know, we have a transit system now. So they feel like they can go anywhere they need to. We've got a website, we've got a Twitter handle, and of course, you know, this customer service line. Our customer service line actually is reducing because people are using so many other methods uh, for, for, for information. It's built, really been good. So don't underestimate the power of technology and, and the Internet, of course. And that's all I have. I'll pass it off to Rich. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. And uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin and Scott and Alicia for having us on. And I'm uh, really glad to hear from local examples first. And I'll only take a few minutes of your time so that uh, T4A kind of wrap things up and do a few questions. Uh, just want to give everyone a, a snapshot of what rural transit looks like in this country. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about TPA before uh, getting into some uh, realities, is we're a national uh, nonprofit membership association committed to mobility for all. We formed in 1987 out of a rural housing initiative actually uh, called Rural America. So our focus has always been in rural communities and rural mobility. Uh, right now we have about 1,300 members, uh, of which 30, about 30% 30 are traditional rural members. And our fastest growing segment is in small urban areas, which for us are large, large areas that uh, compared to what most people think of transit, they're pretty, still pretty small, uh, under 200,000 population. And what we do for our members is things that uh, Washington, D.C. organizations do, uh, advocacy, training, technical assistance, networking events, things like that. We're just a couple blocks away from T4A, actually, in downtown D.C. Uh, and the next couple slides will focus on uh, just kind of the rural uh, portion of our membership, uh, of which uh, Architects, TOG, uh, Nancy, is a member, uh, so we thank them. And uh, just kind of talking about what are some of the trends in rural transit right now? So next slide right now. Uh, we just, uh, the, the, the work that T4A is doing kind of coincides mostly with uh, a, a research paper that APTA and TPA jointly put out uh, just a couple weeks ago now on what's going on in rural transit. And uh, certainly uh, T4A, T4A kind of captures some of these same uh, concepts in, in their uh, issue paper. Uh, we, we found that while population is going down across rural America, transit ridership is going up. Um, even more so than in urban communities. Uh, from 2007 to 2015, uh, there was an 8% increase in rural transit compared to 2.5%. Uh, uh, so all those stories you hear about how nobody's riding the bus anymore, uh, we don't find that to be accurate, actually, especially in rural communities. Uh, there's in total about uh, no more than 1,400 rural transit providers nationwide. So. Here we're talking about the systems that get 53.11 and 53.10 formula funding. And um, as we heard from Kevin, uh, while there's a lot of concern in uh, the federal budget uh, from the president and uh, on the Hill, um, the formula programs are actually holding very firm on across everybody's proposals. So that's a sliver of good news that uh, we like to highlight. Um, in rural areas, you see a greater percentage of seniors, people with disabilities and veterans, those folks who really are most dependent on transit. Um, and we also see higher rates of poverty in those areas than urban areas. So that is part of the reason that uh, us and APRA think that transit ridership is increasing. Because even though fewer people living in rural America, more people actually have a need for it as isolation uh, actually increases. And per capita transit investment is lower in rural areas. So um, that makes the work of providing those trips even harder. Next slide. Uh, and some of the things that generally we hear about from rural transit, um, and these are places that we actually get out to visit pretty often as CTA staff. Uh, uh, we, you'll find the same trip purposes 
on rural transit is any other transit system. And uh, certainly Mike and Nancy shared with you that their systems are taking folks to employment, to jobs, to healthcare, to doctor's appointments, especially dialysis and chemotherapy appointments, um, and education amongst a whole bunch of different other trip services. Uh, generally, their demand response uh, services, although we heard about establishing very focused um, fixed ride services where there's local leadership and commitment to do so. Um, regardless of how they're operating those services, though, we find that rural transit has very small administrative staff. Uh, often there's only a general manager besides the drivers, dispatchers, and mechanics. Uh, so there's not a lot of support out there to do the things that uh, other systems benefit from. Um, one system I visited in rural New Mexico shared an office with the game control warden. Uh, so we see very unique and local uh, solutions to providing these services. Uh, they depend primarily on 5311 funding um, for both their capital and operating funds. And while uh, Nancy gave really good examples of how to use in-kind donations for local match, uh, many of our members have trouble generating local match, um, and we're going to help them kind of uh, share some innovative solutions like the ones that uh, Nancy talked about. But those are some general parameters of what's going on. And now let's just take a quick look at what, you know, in terms of policy and advocacy these systems need. Uh, next. Uh, first of all, everybody needs increased funding. Well, that's not a, hot, a shocker to anybody, but uh, we hear time and again that people need more buses. Uh, Mike certainly talked about that just a minute ago. And if any infrastructure bill happens to move here in Washington, we'd really like to see uh, that investment in transit as infrastructure go through the 5339 bus capital program as much as possible. Um, we, there's been a cutback in bus capital investment since the MAP 21 legislation, and we'd like to see an infrastructure bill uh, to store some of that if possible. Uh, they definitely want to see reduced regulatory burdens, especially on safety and federal uh, and safety and asset management. Not that anyone is not concerned about safety or uh, ma managing their assets, but they're already doing that in order to be good providers. We have some uh, data from the National Transit Database that the rural transit provider can expect a fatality regardless of cause at once every 93 years. So we're not really sure what a lot of these regulatory burdens will actually do to make a difference for safety or asset management in rural communities because they're already doing their best on these things and there's no more money to support these new regulatory burdens. So that's something that we're concerned about at CPA. Uh, flexibility in vehicle purchasing, especially on state bids, which often can say, here's the type of body on chassis vehicle you're going to get, and that's what it is. Uh, we'd like to see some uh, adaptability in using different types of vehicles in different situations. Measuring the performance of rural transit based on outcomes in that how much does it save a community to keep somebody out, a senior citizen, out of a nursing home or keep a person on dialysis alive? What is the value of that trip other than looking at the ridership or revenue per mile? Things that are important to look at when we're talking about big fixed group systems, we want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples or oranges to oranges and not looking at rural transit versus a big fixed route subway in a large city. And also, a lot of our folks are hearing now, why aren't you more like Uber? And why can't you just do that instead? And do we really need a rural transit system here when the private sector solutions might solve it? First of all, a lot of them aren't accessible. Second of all, the true cost of a PNC trip these days is heavily subsidized. Uh, and they don't really have much experience in work, working in rural areas at all. So these are issues that we're going to be paying attention to going forward for rural transit. So um, I'd like to turn it back to Kevin and Alicia. Uh, those are just some brief thoughts on rural transit. And of course, uh, I, along with the rest presenters, are eager to hear your questions. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kevin, Nancy, Edwin, Mike, and Rich. Before we go to Q&A, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to, um, to Steve Davis. He's our Communications Director here at SGA, Smart Growth America, and Transportation for America. And he has an announcement about how you can share your story with us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Alicia. So um, Rich did a great job of uh, trying to paint a picture of what rural transit looks like. We want to help fill in those gaps a little bit and share more of those stories. We heard two good 
uh, fantastic ones earlier from Paris and from Burlington. And uh, we obviously that's a lot of information in those uh, instances, but we want to get started and piecing together some stories from elsewhere. So if you uh, work for a rural transit provider, if you're someone who rides it, depends on it, on a board, uh, any, any way you've got a connection to it and you've got a story to tell, um, you know, similar to what you've heard today or, or different, we want to hear it. So um, the website you should be able to see on the slide on your screen, but it's uh, t4america.org slash rural dash transit dash stories. So hopefully easy to remember. Uh, stop by, um, leave us a story on there. It doesn't have to have all the details. We can follow up with you and, uh, by email and get a little bit more information if we need to. But um, go there, share it uh, with people you know, and uh, hopefully we can uh, get some more of these kind of stories that we can share with decision makers here in D.C. and help convince them of the, of the fact that this is uh, an essential, vital service uh, for millions of Americans who depend on it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. And we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are just uh, two minutes um, before 4 p.m., so if you have to hop off, feel free to do so. We're going to go ahead and answer a few questions. If we do not get to your questions today, uh, we will be answering them via email. So I'll go ahead and start with the first question. The first question is just to the um, everyone that was a speaker. How important is federal funding to operating these transit systems? It's vital. <laughs> it's vital. Um, we, we can't underscore it enough. I mean, it's the, having a federal partner is the difference between being able to buy a new bus or to maintain that bus, um, you know, and, and, and into some state of good repair so that you can have a reliable um, um, uh, service for the public that you, that you are, are servicing. Um, there aren't any other places to look. You know, the, the way the, the, the funding uh, scenario is set up right now, it, it's almost to the point where it's sort of pitting communities that have local resources through their ballot initiative or other um, authorities that may have been afforded through the state, uh, their own state, to generate money versus those that don't have any of those. Um, it, you know, it, it's an essential uh, partner. Uh, federal, the federal government is an essential partner for public transit. And, and I would just add, I mean, we wouldn't exist if it weren't for the federal funds that come through TxDOT and then are allocated to us. There's just, you know, the, the local counties where we serve, um, you know, the income levels are low, the counties are strapped just to fund the things that um, they uh, are responsible for. So uh, that's why we've tried to be creative with our match money um, to come from other sources. Right. Thank you. And there were quite a bit of questions in regards to uh, the, this actual presentation. We will be recording the presentation and sending it out back to everybody after the webinar. Uh, we do have another question, and this I think was uh, for Mr. Edwin. Uh, how do you generate support among elected officials at the local as well as the state level for rural transit projects? Well, we just uh, – we do information. Just we, we provide the, everyone with information, and we just discuss it in, in the council meetings. Um, I attended several county commissioners' meetings as well, and and outlined th to them what we recognized as the needs were, and uh, just communication. That's how, what we did. Um, we I've talked about it some with our state rep. Um, but that's really, I, I just focused on the, the city and the county part of it and let uh, Nancy and ATCOG focus on the state part, although, um, like I said, I, I was in contact with our state rep about it. But it was just communication and letting them know how, what the needs were and giving them uh, examples. And then mm -hmm. having the commitment from the private sector was a big buy-in. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think from our standpoint, finding that one city council member that can be an advocate, I mean, once Edwin got on board, he carried the water for us when it came to dealing with 
um, the other people on the city council and the mayor. So that was very, very helpful. Thank you. And then we're just going to go ahead and close it off with one more question because, again, we want to be considerate of everyone's time. And this one was specifically for Mike. Uh, Mike, so you spoke about the Federal Transit Section 5307, the Urban Transit Grant. Are there any other grants out there similar to that that you have applied for? And uh, they also wanted you to explain a little bit if you had applied as an entity or a part of the, uh, the MPO. Well, we have, just because being part, we're under 200,000 but we're in an MPO area uh, and we're, we're urbanized, which may be somewhat maybe different from rural agencies. Uh, but yeah. through the MPO, we were able to, we, we're the lead agency, able to apply for that. Um, it's an application process, but as I said, it's, it's allocated to you through a formula already, uh, so it wasn't really competitive. So that's an annually ongoing grant that we, we requested. Uh, we did get a small grant from our state DOT for about $300,000 to help us uh, with non-capital items. Uh, and along with that and our transit tax, that's really our three main areas is that federal grant, as, as everyone said, it's vital. You can't really operate much without the federal piece. And then you'll get a small portion maybe from your state. And then locally, if you have any tools, um, you know, or partners, you know, we, we, the community college helps us, uh, United Way helps us. I mean, we have a very similar setup as mentioned is in Texas. Uh, the hospital helps uh, co with a contribution. So uh, the three main things are the federal grant, uh, our transit tax, and a little bit from our state DOT. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and close it off with Kevin. Okay, Alicia, thank you very much. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody for participating on the, on the uh, call today and, and in the webinar. Uh, just to close things out, I, I think I'd summarize by saying that, you know, the state of funding for public transportation programs at the federal level is in a precarious state. And we are just urging every tr rural transit property to share their story uh, with us, but also, you know, uh, in, through your own means, um, it, uh, through your own social media uh, venues, et cetera, because that word has to get to Congress. That was the point of the AFTA study uh, in so many ways that, that Rich talked about, that this is not an urban issue. This is an every town in America issue, and it's very important that members of Congress hear that as they consider to cut phase out or eliminate existing uh, programs for public transit, including the formula, the formula funding that so many rural properties are dependent upon. So I thank you for your time today. Please contact us here at T4A if you have any questions at all. We're happy to take them. Uh, we're on with a phone call or an email away. Thank you.